San Diego straddles both the Mexican border and the Pacific Rim. So how well poised are we to compete in the global marketplace? Good evening, I'm Gloria Penner. Globalization was a hot topic in San Diego this week as the World Trade Center hosted business leaders for talks on international trade. Tonight, we explore how San Diego rates on a global business scale with an economist, a foreign trade specialist, and an executive from the World Trade Center. And we'll take you inside a San Diego high school where globalization is the focus of the lessons these students get every day. We'll start with a popular argument that's much in the news. In his best-selling book, The World is Flat About the Global Economy, journalist Thomas, and Thomas Friedman argues that the world is shrinking and increasingly interconnected. Friedman says that new technologies are allowing more people and more companies around the globe to compete and collaborate than ever before. So let me start with you, Alan G. You're an economist who travels frequently between Asia and San Diego as you track the economic trends. What are we talking about when we talk about globalization? Well, globalization refers to the fact that there's a lot more business now done on an international basis. Uh, companies are establishing operations uh, overseas. There's a lot more international trade going on than there has been in the past. So how does this play out in San Diego? Well, some San Diego companies are making efforts to uh, tap some of these world wide markets are also using um, foreign countries as a production platform. Uh, some companies, for example, setting up operations in China and then, then importing the goods into the United States. Well, this is true. Many of us, uh, Ambassador David Dow, have had the experience of calling our credit card companies and, and talking to a clerk who's in India, or, or maybe we know someone who's lost a job because of outsourcing. Those are the two things that strike me as what we know about globalization. How else is globalization affecting the lives of people in San Diego? Well, the, the most obvious way that globalization affects the lives of average Americans is by keeping down the cost of consumer goods. Ah. And the fact is, and, and there's a downside to this as well, but international trade means that when one goes into Walmart now, a very high percentage of the the content that's being sold, probably 85 or 90 percent, is made overseas where it's cheaper to make it. In the United States now no longer has, for instance, a shoe industry or clothing industry or many other things that were staples of our economy because it's easier and cheaper to make them overseas and consumers like that. Right. But Hugh Constant, your your job really is to is to match local businesses with overseas markets and suppliers. Is this not true? Absolutely. So, the World Trade Center helps companies to both import and export. So picking up on what uh, Jeffrey David I was saying, um, do we see this working both ways whereby we have uh, the the goods coming in and also we are we are sending goods out and you have to be in the global marketplace to thrive. Absolutely, and it's not just in trade. I mean, I think that San Diego, uh, with its major universities, is clearly feeling the pinch now with Homeland Security. Uh, reduced number of students that are coming here to study. It's, it's harder for faculty to come and work here. You, you brought a couple of examples <coughs> with you of, of items that, <laughs> that sort of manifest themselves as being a result of the global economy. Yes, a vast array. We uh, import cookies from Scotland. Uh, we have memory sticks from Taiwan. I have a Korean telephone uh, that has CDMA from Qualcomm. And America exports ginseng to China. We have the best ginseng. Well, you know, that, that makes me feel, uh, Alan Jin, that our geographic location on the border and as a gateway to the Pacific Rim has to give us some advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, some potential potential advantage there, but, but uh, we've also been, been, been adversely uh, affected. Uh, for example, one industry in recent years that, that's seen a lot of loss of jobs here in the region has been in what's called the, the uh, audio and visit 
video uh, manufacturing sector. That's, that's the assembly of televisions, for example. You saw a lot of that used to go on, on along the I-15 corridor, right. and, and, and most of that now has moved out of San Diego, either in Mexico or, or even uh, over, uh, over in, in Asia. The problem that we have in terms of our geographic locations, we're, we're kind of off in a cul-de-sac here in the southwest corner of the U.S., and our lack of transportation infrastructure is, is hurting us. Uh, lack of, a, uh, of, a, of an international airport where we can get direct flights to Asia, and also uh, the port facilities, uh, container capacity is not up to uh, up to the level that, that, that we need it to be at. So you're, you're really talking about how San Diego is not ready for global competition rather than how it is ready for global competition. We need to, we need to do a lot more, and uh, uh, we, need, we need efforts like, uh, like he, he was uh, undertaking at the World Trade Center in order to, to help us. And I think one area where we do need a lot of work is in the area of transportation infrastructure. Okay, well, we did send KPBS photojournalist Robert Hotes to the World Trade Center Conference yesterday to talk with William Boyer. He's a national accounts director for NYK Logistics and Mega Carrier. His San Diego-based company specializes in transporting a variety of products ranging from raw lumber to completed electronics equipment by land, sea, and air. Locally, they carry loads between the Mexican maquiladoras, or manufacturing plants, and Southern California's ports. And we asked him how NAFTA has impacted his board of business, and here's what he said. With NAFTA, um, it's created an advantage for us to make those jobs available right here in North America and to make things closer. In transportation, you're dealing with time and distance. And with um, the NAFTA opening up more free trade and, and globalization for the San Diego market area, we've been able to capitalize with having those manufacturing facilities along the border, stretching from San Diego through to Harlingen and Brownsville, the most southern reaches of Texas, and uh, moving that freight across the border, whereas moving it direct from China or Japan or someplace like that, it uh, just makes it more economical, really. Jeffrey David, you were very involved in the establishment of NAFTA, and you heard what Bill Boyer had to say. What's, what's your take on the impact of the way NAFTA's worked out? Well, I think NAFTA's worked out very well for both Mexico and the United States. There have been economic dislocations. We know about them. Government perhaps should do more to help people who have lost their jobs in both countries. But the fact of the matter is we are selling much more to Mexico now probably two to three times as much American product goes to Mexico than it did before and after. Is that, that good? That's very good because that means jobs. Uh, and what it also means is that a lot of product that we import from Mexico, and we have tripled our imports or more from Mexico in the last 10 years, have component parts from the United States. If we were importing those same products from the Orient, for instance, chances are the component parts would not be from the United States. So San Diego is in a good position to take advantage of the closeness with Mexico. It has not, it seems to me, taken as much advantage, for instance, as the Texas ports of entry. And that's something that maybe the city ought to be looking at. Are we in the same league, however, Hugh, as uh, uh, cities like Miami or Seattle in terms of the, being a global gateway? Well, again, I think I'd reiterate the point about transportation infrastructure. Clearly, San Diego lacking an international airport, uh, not having a containerized port, having a very small port, in fact, uh, is at a disadvantage. We know with the rail system, anything that goes on the rail has to go up to Los Angeles, so an east-west rail is another opportunity. But on the other hand, Alan, you're agreeing with Hugh, but we are attracting international companies. We have Sony, we have Hitachi, Kyocera Wireless. I mean, if, if there's this transportation problem, why are we, why are we attracting international companies to set up business in San Diego? Well, we're attracting some, but, but uh, I think uh, we could attract more. As uh, Ambassador David Al indicated, the Texas cities are taking a, a greater advantage of the opportunities created by NAFTA. Part of that is geographic in the sense that the Texas cities are right above the big manufacturing centers, which are more, more located more in central Mexico, while we're kind of above Baja California, kind of a little bit, a little bit isolated here. Okay, and Gloria, so, yes. if, I, if I could add, sure. just, 
you know, what attracts these companies to San Diego? Uh, we have a very vibrant community, particularly in high tech. A lot of very creative, innovative people. And to be at the cutting edge and to develop products that we can sell around the world, that's really key. But we are outsourcing, aren't we? I mean, uh, I uh, there is concern that outsourcing results in job loss. And how much of a problem is it for San Diego? Well, I suspect uh, in some of the high-tech firms, uh, certainly in manufacturing, outsourcing can be a, a concern. But I don't think we should worry that much about outsourcing. We shouldn't. No. First, if you look at the the statistics and the numbers, uh, as a percentage of the total workforce in the United States, the number of jobs that have been outsourced is, while important to, you know, an individual, when you're unemployed, I read this the other day, and maybe it was Tom Friedman in his book said, you know, it doesn't matter whether the unemployment rate is 5% or 4%, when you don't have a job, it's 100%. That's right. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is that by outsourcing, we become more competitive. And this is particularly important for a place like San Diego, because the world economy uh, is moving in a direction that San Diego is particularly well suited to take advantage of. Hmm. We're talking about knowledge-based economy. We're talking about services. That's We're talking about computer-based economies. Yeah. Uh, and this is the place. Well, I mean, uh, do you agree with that, Alan? Do you think that, you know, we're we're just in the right place at the right time, or do you continue to have concerns? We, we, we are well placed uh, with our, our universities uh, providing educated uh, uh, employees of the workforce in areas like biotechnology and telecommunications and things like that. But uh, I, I'm a little concerned in the sense that, that the numbers of these jobs created may not be enough to offset the loss that we've seen in manufacturing areas. So, so where, whereas uh, some people may benefit, I'm worried about a growing class of people who may not be able to compete in a global in a global economy. Well, go ahead, Hugh. Uh, no, I was just going to jump in again. Uh, one point that was made at yesterday's World Trade Center conference was uh, the real demand for logistics. Uh, specialists and jobs. Uh, these require less educated, uh, less educated workforce, but they're very well paying, and they can replace some of those manufacturing jobs. Let, let me pick up on uh, another issue where there's a feeling that it's not all coming up bruises for San Diego businesses that are trying to compete in the global marketplace. We asked William Boyer of NYK Logistics, a mega carrier, if for him there's a downside to globalization for San Diego, and here's what he told Full Focus. You know, with the unfortunate situation of September 11, you know, we've had to tighten up our securities and, and put our arms more around, you know, how we allow things and people to move in and out of the United States. So there's been a little bit of tightening there, but I think our United States and, and partner governments here in North America has, has come to the challenge where they've made it safer, better, um, as it's become bigger. And so there's some challenges there, but they're all a part of a process that we've been able to work through and, and still continue to make things happen in a global market. What, what about that, uh, Jeffrey? Do you sense now that uh, we are well positioned to make it happen? I'm thinking specifically about the record high housing prices. I mean, how can you bring workers in to uh, take advantage of whatever jobs we do create for the global marketplace? Well, the, the, the high housing prices here in, in, in San Diego are a topic of everybody's conversations. And it is a concern. It has to be a concern. I think the fact of the matter is, is that San Diego nevertheless, nevertheless does have a good position. With the high housing prices, people are still coming in. But you and have to have salaries to match the housing You have to have prices. salaries, and the heaven knows where people get the salaries to buy the houses, but they do. The, the, the real issue, I, it seems to me, and I, going back to what Mr. Boyer was talking about on the border, is that I think sub since September 11th in the last few years, we've done a better job accommodating to the shipment of goods across the border. They, they're, the customs agencies of <clears throat> Mexico and the U.S. are doing a better job. I don't think we've done as good a job on the movement of people. And at base, people are what make economies run, and I don't think we're doing a very good job in our migration policies or even in the border crossing policies. Well, I, you know, I think we're so lucky in San Diego. 
it's you know the most beautiful place in the world people love to live here so we have this opportunity to attract the best and the brightest from around the world whether these are scientists or engineers or educators or investors or business managers folks want to come and live and work here we, but we only have a minute left so, but the, the last key in all this I think Alan is education are our schools adequately preparing our children for globalization you have we, we definitely knew uh, we definitely need to do a better job. Uh, we need improved education, particularly I think in the math and, uh, and sciences. Uh, we're lagging uh, the, the rest of the world in, in those areas. What do you think? Absolutely. Education is key. It's our cutting edge. Well, you, you were talking about, you know, the kinds of jobs that are, are available here. Don't people have to be specifically educated for those jobs? In logistics, transportation, it's mostly on-the-job training rather than uh, school training or education. Well, I was thinking of our technology industry, however. I mean, don't you have to have very special training to, in science and math to bring our kids the up United to States speed? has lost its edge in science and technology. Uh, ten years ago, we were producing the majority of the world's PhDs in science and technology. People were flocking here uh, to, to get degrees and to work in our universities. It's not happening with as much frequency. None of those things. It's a real problem. Well, some San Diego schools are adapting their curriculum to meet the challenge of the global job market. KPBS reporter Rebecca Tolan visited a Point Loma High School where students are learning to compete in the new world economy. Rebecca? Gloria, High Tech High International is casting its gaze around the globe. The first year charter school emphasizes international issues from world trade to water pollution, population growth to pluralism. Students learn languages and even study abroad. You'll also notice the worldly focus in most aspects of campus life. Rhythms of Cuba. Relax the head. Postures from India. They could have used all those lives to help the French and the Discussion army. of France. Focus faces and flags of the world. It's not your typical high school. It's High Tech High International. It's all to put um, an international spin on things because this is High Tech High International. And so we're talking about international relations, talking about communicating with other countries and preparing us to do that. Do people have the right to overthrow an unjust system for a just system? How much this is 10th grade humanities in the Model United Nations room. And it was more peaceful than... than the French Revolution, which happened after. Students the debate revolutions, the past the and present. Project-based learning brings the lessons to life. Jennifer Peterson challenges students to think about a world beyond borders. Well, I think obviously with globalization and the way the economy is going and the way business works these days, it's really inevitable that you're going to have to interact with people in other countries. In order for us to continue to be the great nation that we are, we can't remain isolated. Uh, in today's world, they, they really need to understand that they'll be competing not just with other people in the United States, but with people in uh, all over the world. Brian Delgado is the Dean of Students. He oversees 190 high schoolers on the brand new campus at the former Naval Training Center. So you should really feel the stretch right here. That's it. Delgado supervises student activities, but you may catch him teaching a yoga class. While there's flexibility here, the schedule is rigorous. Delgado wants kids to understand they need education and innovation to compete in today's world. And then you look at the potential workforce that there's, you know, if you have an understanding of population, that there's over a billion people in China, over a billion people in, in India, and they're going to be competing for similar jobs if they stop after high school, if they don't continue to educate themselves. I, d I don't agree with violence used in, in any kind of situation, but... Matija Raja feels U.S. schools are behind those from his home country of Serbia. After his family moved to San Diego, Raja enrolled in the charter school for its academic challenge and cultural diversity. Even though people have different cultures, different religion, they live in different places, basics of human nature are still the same. I like this roller coaster. 
Deci Centi Kilo Mega. Students here learn the metric system of measurement. By building model roller coasters, they learn the whole world doesn't operate like the U.S. on the English system of inches and feet. It usually works. We can, it seems like it's jumping off right here. Yeah. The other teaching team that we did the project with, they used the metric system and we used the standard American system using like feet, they used the meters. And the only way we could communicate with them was through email or we had to schedule a business meeting. We had an overseas group where we had to communicate with them overseas. Um, and try and build a roller coaster together without actually discussing it in person. The overseas group was actually based here on campus though, right? Yeah. Rachel Louie and Bryson Armstrong constructed the coasters as part of a ninth grade physics assignment. They learned about centrifugal <laughs> force and cross communication. Um, this first part was built with the English system and the back part was done with the metric. So it was two different pieces and you put them together? Yes. What did you learn? I learned, I learned um, the physics. I learned, I learned a little bit about myself. Learned how I deal under pressure. This is a very pressure thing to see if it works. It's a big part of my grade. Whether it's science or arts, most everything has an international flair. Hey, rhythm. And it's a huge bridge between cultures. Um, I mean, music is one of those few things that uh, is truly an international language, as, they, as you often hear it said. Will Turner teaches world music. He exposes kids to a range of traditions, integrating Latin-based tunes with instruments from around the world. Gray Ann Ward plays the Congo drums. Yeah, like a little African flair, and the people, you know, like, oh, I can dance to this, you know, I do the little groove on and everything. Then you have more of the Latin kind of thing, you do more little, you know, swervy, kind of suave kind of stuff. And then you have just different types of music that connects everybody. I like being able to learn about these things and becoming more aware of my surroundings instead of just myself and what's right around me, but more of the whole world. And yeah. Sophomore Laura Bika admits she didn't think about other countries much before coming to High Tech High International. Teachers in today's interconnected world say it's never too soon to teach tolerance. These kids, you know, in another 15 years are going to be right in the thick of a very, very global economy. And, and I think they need to have an understanding of other cultures and a respect for, for other cultures. High Tech High International just opened this year, but already there isn't enough space for all the applicants. The school could only accept one student for every three students that applied, Gloria. So so what kind of system do they use to parcel out the few spaces that are available? Well, instead of actually selecting students based on their grades, instead they use a lottery system. So it's actually random, and they say that's resulted in a more diverse student body. Okay. Well, I thank you very very much, Rebecca. Thanks to Rebecca Tolan for her report and to Alan Jin, Jeffrey David Au, and Hugh Constant. To learn more about globalization, visit our website at kpbs.org. And now it's your turn to talk back. Michael Pelling of University City wrote in after viewing our program Tuesday about the pension board indictments. He said, while the recent indictments of pension board officials are titillating, I hope the law larger root issue, namely the underfunding of the pension system as a consequence of our almost maniacal resistance to taxes is not ignored. The underhanded process by which this all came about must of course be exposed and lawbreakers be punished. But the fundamental problem will remain if we are unwilling to tax ourselves enough for the infrastructure and services we demand. And Joe Ellis from Oceanside responded to our poll program, exploring San Diegan's support of the arts. He said, I am attempting to become more acquainted with theater and dance, and I am fortunate to be able to enjoy the productions at the Miracosta College Theater. Forget venues like the ones at the Old Globe or downtown San Diego. Wondering about how deserving we are of the arts has nothing to do with the success of the arts. Tickets. Ticket prices are everything.
And if you've got something to say about tonight's program, feel free to write to us at the address on the screen. And tune in again tomorrow night when we bring together a panel of local journalists to take you inside the week's top stories. For KPBS, I'm Gloria Penner. Good night.